uh, his way of doing it, um, and from the student that I talked to, it was very effective, is that he would stick his fingers in the students' mouths to sure. check to see where their thumb position was. And he would have the students do the same to him. And when I first read this, I didn't really believe it until I met some of the students. One of the students, a tenor sax player, was coming through town, and I went in specifically to find him. He, he, he confirmed that story and some more horrific stories, if you want to hear more uh, later. Um, uh, Joe Miola, I think it, it, uh, Berkeley used to do the same thing from some people that I've spoken to. And they, the, the people that I spoke to all said it was a very effective way of teaching, but obviously not something that we can do. So I'm trying to find other creative ways using uh, examples away from the clarinet and different kinds of exercises to teach these techniques. Squeaking on the clarinet is something that most people know about, even if you're not a clarinet, it's even made it into popular culture. This is a very recent um, cartoon in a Sunday funny paper, some of you may have actually seen it. You can, you can see here that Larry is threatening to go all squeaky on his clarinet unless the people uh, give him some money. Uh, for many people, that's the, the, judge, the judgment of a good clarinet recital. My niece gave a little performance on her clarinet. I wasn't in town to hear it. I asked my brother-in-law how it went, and he said, well, she didn't squeak. And that was it. And that was, for him, that was a good recital. There's no squeaking, and it's, and it's quality. Um, so it's everywhere, and it's something that we know about, and it's something that we as an adult, uh, as adults, if we're playing and we make a squeak, maybe it's a little bit embarrassing. But I think that for young students, it can be really traumatic experience. You're in your junior high band rehearsal and you let go some huge squawk, and maybe the rehearsal stops, or maybe some people laugh. And it can really affect it can really affect you. It can make you not want to play the clarinet, which is obviously not what we want as, as music instructors. And um, it, unless we as teachers sort of intervene and give the students a very direct way to fix their squeaks, they're going to just find a way to fix it themselves. And the most popular way to fix your squeaks is to stop, is to back up on the air support. And it totally works. If you don't blow, you don't squeak. You know, if you don't try, you don't fail. It's a little bit like cutting off your head to cure acne. It, it fixes the problem, but it causes this host of other problems, right? So we back up on the air to avoid squeaking, and sure, we don't squeak, but boy, we get all these other tone problems and pitch problems and tonguing problems uh, that are caused by it. So I find that a lot of what I do with my young students is trying to build up their confidence to really blow and, and support and blow the air into the planet. So I'm gonna start by giving you a, a sort of, not a quick fix, but one way that works really well that you can use in the middle of a band rehearsal or in the middle of a lesson uh, to help address this problem. And then I'll spend the rest of my lecture talking a little bit about why this works. And I discovered this quite by accident. I had a student who was sort of chronically squeaking. They had this passage, and every time they came through the snow, they would squeak. So I said, well, do it on purpose. You know, they would say, oh, yeah, you know, when I was practicing, every time I get to this point, I make a squeak. And I said, well, do it on purpose. And I tried to make them do it deliberately, and they couldn't do it. And this happens 90% of the time. If I try to make them squeak very deliberately, they can't do it which points a little bit to the psychological aspect of squeaking and also the physiological aspect of it. I think students can't squeak on purpose because they often just don't know what's going on, either physically or acoustically with the clarinet. So if you can explain just a few basic things, they can understand where the squeak comes from and then it's much less frightening. So the process is this. Have the students try to squeak deliberately. Often they can't do it. Second step is to just keep at it. Have them try a few more times. Usually after a few tries, you can get them to squeak on command. So let's say they're playing uh, the beginning of the Weber Concertina, all right? Many of you know the Weber Concertina. The joke among clarinetists is that once you get past the first note, the rest of the, the concertino is easy. The first note, people tend to be a little bit nervous about. So you have your first note. You get a nice little squeak there. So I'll have to try to make the students do it in a very deliberate kind of way. And get them to the, to the, to the point where they can do it on, on demand. Step three, the final step, is then have them make some kind of an adjustment. And at this point, we don't have to be specific. Tell them to make some kind of an adjustment with their bottom lip or with their oral cavity to make a change until they get the note that they want. And most students can do it with just that little explanation. And then eventually they get 
you're much more confident to hit the note directly head on. That's kind of a quick fix sort of thing you can do if you're in the middle of a band rehearsal or in the middle of a lesson and you don't want to stop to give a big explanation about how all this works. And what that marks is the beginning of muscular memory, the beginning of them developing their muscular memory. And they learn, oh, okay, if I go here, I get this note, and if I go here, I get this note. Here, this note, here, this note. You have them go back and forth, and they learn pretty quickly um, how, to, how to avoid the squeak. Once they can do that, then you can go back and explain some of the ideas of how it works. And I find that if students understand just a couple of basic acoustic principles, they can have much better luck at leading the, the squeak out of their practice and building up their confidence. And one of those concepts is that the clarinet, in many respects, functions like a brass instrument, in that from any one fingering, we get a variety of notes. I was in a French horn lecture this morning, and, and the French horn person was talking about just this kind of thing. And he was saying, oh, it's not like clarinet, where you push down the key and the correct note comes out. Well, even, even clarinet isn't like that, unfortunately. I wish it was. It would be, I wouldn't be giving this lecture if that's the way the clarinet works. Press the note, the note comes out, and your job's done. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And it functions more like a brass instrument. If we start thinking of it this way, it answers a lot of different questions. So let's look here. We have the basic trumpet harmonics here. Okay, starting with the top with our fundamental, our first mode of vibration. And trumpet all brass players in general learn early on that from this fundamental, this pedal tone, if they speed up their air, if they tighten up their lips a little bit, I apologize for grossly oversimplifying brass technique, but for the purpose of my lecture, I'm going to. T tightening up the lips, speeding up the air speed, they can get that fundamental, that first partial, to vibrate in a different mode. They can make it vibrate twice as fast, so then you get an octave harmony. You can continue on the scale by blowing a little faster. You can get it to vibrate three times as fast as the fundamental, getting an octave and a fifth, and so on up the harmonic series. Trumpet plays first partial, second partial, third partial, fourth partial. And most brass players right from the beginning have to develop this muscular memory technique that I was talking about. And they learn, if I use this air speed, I get this note. If I use this air speed, I get a different note. My premise is that we have to do very much the same thing on the clarinet. So here's our uh, here's a basic kind of loop slur exercise that a brass player might do. So the first part is all with no <coughs> second partial, third partial, fourth partial, all on one finger. And then they go down, second bow, Most brass players have many different kinds of uh, loop slurs that they do. I think we should have lip slurs, or we can call them harmonic exercises, for the clarinet to do as well, because we can't depend on our keys. So here's our clarinet harmonic series. Very similar, except for the fact that the clarinet only overblows odd numbered partials. For a variety of acoustic reasons that could be the subject of a whole other lecture all by itself. Suffice it to say, the clarinet is uh, the only wind instrument that has a cylindrical bore that's closed on one end and open on the other. There are other instruments that have a cylindrical, cylindrical bore, like the flute, <coughs> but the flute functions as open on both ends. Uh, there are other instruments, like the oboe bassoon, that are closed on one end and open on the other, but they have a conical bore. The clarinet's the only instrument with this set of properties, closed on one end, open on the other, cylinder in between. And that makes the air wave fold over on itself four times. Uh, which gives it a variety, which is what gives it its uniquely beautiful sound, but it also gives it a unique set of weird problems that we as clarinet players have to deal with. Now you might say, well, clarinets have register keys, right? So brass players, brass instruments don't have register keys. They have to do these lip slur exercises. Clarinet has register keys, so why do we need to do these exercises? Well, unfortunately, the register keys on the clarinet just don't function very well. Um, so if we look at the, the, the thumb key on the back, our register key on, register key on the back that takes us from first to third partial, it's much too big to be the register key. The register key should be like a pinhole, like the register key on an oboe. It's also in the wrong place for most of the notes. Uh, physicist Arthur Bernard uh, talked uh, in one of his books about how to be a perfect register key it has to break the wave right at the note 
right? Much like a guitar player playing a harmonica on the string, the registry key should be right at that note to, to break it perfectly. And um, different pitches have different wavelengths. Lower notes have longer wavelengths, higher notes have shorter wavelengths, so the notes all have different spaces. So you have to have a mechanism, you have to have a different register key for every note. B, C, C sharp, D, E sharp, E, F, etc. on up. The mechanism would be so complex that it would be unusable. So what most makers do is they just aim for the middle of third partial, the F and G uh, on top of the staff. Uh, and those notes work relatively well, but the further away you get from those pitches, the less well it works. So you can, you can demonstrate this yourself at home by uh, taking the register key on and off for certain pitches. So if I do F, not so bad. But the further away I get from F, you can hear it's more and more out of tune. By the time I get to the B, it's, it's quiet. And then if you go the opposite direction, if you go up, you get the same sort of issue. So F and G, not so bad. also has to be throat B flat, which is why the throat B flat stinks. Right? The, the side B flat is much better because the tone hole is just bigger. So it's a little bit like a Swiss army knife. It does all of these things, it doesn't do any of them very well. <laughs> and then when we go from third to fifth partial, our left hand first finger now becomes our register key, right? That's the register key, and it has a lot of the same issues. It's in the wrong place, and it's too big, uh, which is part of why we use the half hole technique. Yes. You ever wondered why we use the half hole technique? Um, that's why. Um, uh, having a much smaller opening, the register key is just the same But it has a lot of the same problems. And then if you continue on up to the second partial, there's, there is no register. So uh, when we're playing in that altissimo above that, we're playing the clarinet very much like a brass player does. Many of the notes have exactly the same fingerings, and we have to use only our lips and our armature and our voicing to get the different pitches to come up. So this is part of why all these structural problems are why I feel it's really useful for clarinet players to learn uh, some lip slips, some harmonic exercises. <laughs> Now, how do we do this? Do we do it in the way that the trumpet players do? Do we do it with airspeed and tightening up our lips? No. The basic principles are sort of the same, but the, the way we get the notes to change is not at all the same. So brass players will speed up their air. For us, maybe it's a little bit of faster air, but it's more about the placement of the bottom lip and the shape of the oral cavity. So I'm going to talk about those, uh, those two things separately. So let's start with oral cavity shape. By changing the shape of our oral cavity, uh, we can emphasize different partials. So what you're doing uh, by, by doing that is you're creating a standing wave. The standing wave is when you have a size, a, size, a resonating chamber, it could be a room, it could be a concert hall, it could be your oral cavity, that is some exact multiple of the harmonic you're trying to produce. So in other words, if the wavelength is one inch long, you're trying to make something that's some multiple of one inch. And what happens is you get a standing wave and that one partial is emphasized to the expense of all the others. This is something that people who design concert halls try to avoid, right? You're trying to avoid having one note that's much louder than all the other notes. You're trying to eliminate any standing waves in concert halls. Here we're actually trying to create a standing wave. And because of the weird acoustic properties of the clarinet that I mentioned earlier, the oral cavity becomes a real part of the instrument. Now, of course, this is true for other instruments like oboe and bassoon, but it seems to be much more important for clarinet. Something, once again, about the odd number of partials, the way the wave folds over. Your oral cavity determines much more of your tone than your outer embouchure. I think as teachers, we tend to teach more of the outer embouchure because it's easier to see. Right? There's that old joke about the man looking under the light lamppost. Looking under the lamppost and the police officer comes along and says, what are you looking for? He says, I'm looking for my car keys. And the officer says, where did you lose them? The guy says, I lost them three blocks over. The man says, why are you looking for them here? And he says, because the light is better. <laughs> I, think, I think we tend to teach this, the outer arm, sure, more because the light is better. It's just easier to see. 
When in fact the oral cavity, I think, actually has dictates much more the kind of sound we make than the other one. And you may notice this yourself. You may occasionally have a student that has an unconventional or an ugly looking embouchure that makes a beautiful sound. Uh, you can also see the opposite. You can have a student who makes a textbook perfect, breezy page one. This is how you play the clarinet kind of embouchure, and doesn't sound very good. And I think that's uh, because of the oral cavity shape. Very much like a violin, right? It's the body body of the violin that determines its tone. It's not so much the string. So the body of the violin makes the difference between the Stradivarius and the cheap fiddle. So we want to make Stradivarius oral cavity, right? We want our, our oral cavities to be like a tune, like a fine violin. And it may seem weird to teach this. This is why Joe Allard was sticking his fingers in people's mouths, because it was just easier to do that than to explain it. Um, but the technique is actually not so hard to learn, and it's very ancient. It's something that comes up, this kind of oral cavity shaping to emphasize harmonics, comes up in folk musics and, and various primitive musics. You find it in uh, tube and throat singing, overtone singing, uh, Jews harp, when people play the Jews harp, uh, didgeridoo, you find it a lot of different ways. So I find it useful to use examples away from the clarinet to demonstrate these techniques to my students. So if you look on YouTube for in tube and throat singing or overtone singing, you can find lots of great examples. Here's one that I found that I really like. Anne Marie Haefeli, the famous uh, overtone singer. And what she's doing is she's singing one pitch with her vocal cords, creating a, a, a pitch rich in overtones. And then she uses her vocal track to create standing waves where she can bring out different, uh, different partials. So let's see if the audio works. Here's another example. This is a juice harp player, and this is probably more like the clarinet in that uh, the juice harp, for those of you who have never played one, it's a metal frame with a vibrating tongue, and the tongue just vibrates one pitch. It makes kind of a drone, and he's changing the shape of his oral cavity to bring out different partials and also to create a kind of rhythmic, uh, rhythmic interest. And this is probably more like the clarinet in that you have this literally a vibrating reed in the front of the mouth and he's changing the shape of his oral cavity. talking about standing waves or overtone singing, I just say, do this thing. I do it, I show them how to do it, I give them the tuner, they can do it as well. You can try this yourself in the privacy of your own home. I get a little tuner. this week is they don't they just have a, we don't have awareness of that part of our body so that's one way to begin that so oral cavity shape that's one thing that we control the other part of the puzzle whoops is the placement of the bottom lip on the reed 
So the reed also has these nodes of vibration. We want to find these places, and a node would be defined as, uh, in, in a way, the, the place of least amplitude, the place where the string, for example, is not vibrating. String players do this a lot, where they'll put their finger on the string, just lightly touch it at a certain point, and you can, in effect, trick the string into thinking that it's a different length than it is. So if a guitar player has a string of a certain length and they put their finger right in the middle and pluck the string, they'll get an octave. They're tricking the string into thinking it's half as long as it is. So if I had a guitar, I would demonstrate. Here's a little video of a guitar player doing just that. These notes all sound one octave higher than the regular open strings would sound. see in third partial, for instance, there are two nodes. The little red dot indicates uh, those. In fifth partial, there's four different nodes. So you can do this on strings. We need to do very much the same thing on the clarinet reed. By placing your jaw on different nodes, you can very easily excite the reed into a different mode of vibration. And this is part of the, the squeak thing, because it's so easy to do and they're relatively close together. It's very easy to put your lip on a partial that you don't want. And that's what a squeak is, just an, uh, a, a wrong partial. Uh, and that's part of what I think takes away the fear of a squeak. If you tell students, you know, there is no note that's a squeak, right? We don't have C, C sharp, D, squeak, E, F. Right? <laughs> it's a little bit like a weed. What's a weed in your garden? A weed is a plant you don't want. There's no plant called weed, right? So if you're growing a lawn and you have dandelions, the dandelion is a weed. If you're growing dandelions for dandelion reeds, then it's, then it's not a weed. It's the same thing with the squeak. Uh, there really is no squeak note. It's just you accidentally chose the wrong partial. Uh, and even just that, just saying that, just kind of takes some of, the, some of the fear away from it. So we need to do the same thing with our bottom lip on the reed. And if we have, and this is this example that I used earlier on, if you take this example, and you can see all the different nodes along the bottom. And different pitches will have more than one note. So like I was saying, third partial has two notes. Fifth partial has five notes. And you can put your finger on any one of those notes and get the same pitch. You can demonstrate this. I should have asked for a piano. If you have a, a piano where you can get access to the strings, you can press the string lightly and, and play the key, and you'll get um, different harmonics. And you'll notice that you can get sometimes the same harmonic in two different places. That's because the higher harmonics have more, uh, more spots. So you can see that's listed along the bottom. If you turn that sideways, up and down, you can think of this as kind of the clarinet reed. There's all these different nodes where you can just lightly place your bottom lip. It has nothing to do with pressure. There's no pressure. It's just a light placement. So here's the reed. You can think of it this way. They're fairly close together. Um, but you can get all the different partials to come out by, by, by placing them. Now, Putting it all together. It's a, it's a, it seems like a lot of information. If you explain all of this up front, you can get a lot of paralysis by analysis, right? So what I like to do is just to have the students do it in a, in a very simple and playful kind of way. So one of the first things I'll do is uh, you can uh, take, a, take a schwab and stick it in your belt and have them finger a low E and blow. And you'll get some partial. the same harmonic series as a bugle. I need to play a bugle song. All right, so, so I'll have them do this, and you close up all the holes, essentially, you finger a low E, and you have them blow. So usually what happens, the first one I do this with students, is you get, you get nothing, because they're not used to blowing that hard. So, uh, and this is the kind of second moral of my story. By working to fix the squeak, you can fix a lot of other problems. It's a great launching pad to deal with a lot of the other issues of the clarinet. I find that when students get good at fixing the squeak, surprise, surprise, their tone improves, their intonation improves, it fixes a lot of uh, other side issues. So one of the things that it fixes is uh, air support, especially by doing this little exercise. So at first you'll get nothing. Um, um, in order to get sound, the students really have to open their mouth and really blow. 
And those are two things that are just fluid for playing a plane in general. Opening the mouth, letting go of the reed, and blowing in. And I'll have them do some harmonic long tones. Or just get the swap the bell, and we'll just do some long tones, and whatever note comes out, comes out. Often, if they're tight, they'll get very, very high harmonics. So we'll get 13th partial. They'll get super duper strong. And uh, that just shows you how tight they are. And then that's fine. You can get that, do some of those, and then gradually work to get them to come to lower partial. Nice and open with a nice, healthy air. And that's kind of fun. Most students can do that without a lot of preamble. You don't have to tell them what's going on. They don't need to know what's going on, right? Um, and once they get it, then afterwards, I'll explain it to them little by little. So harmonic, long tones with the swab and the bell is usually where I'll start. And then the second thing you can do is literally you call. And I find they work a little bit better if you put the bell on the calf of your leg. I could do it standing up, but I'm not that brave. sort of do that. Um, you know, I don't have to write it out. I wouldn't give it to them. This is strictly for the presentation. When I have them do it, I just have you just play some people call. I play, you play, and we go back and forth. And they very quickly get the feeling of it. You start to feel the focus, and you start to feel that ping, that characteristic clarinet ping, really comes out when you do those people call. start to, to feel. Uh, and then, and that works even with quite young students can usually do these, and they love doing it. The, the, um, elementary school, junior high students love to do this. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of fun for them. Then, once you can do that, I'll move on to maybe some more formal kind of harmonic exercise. And this is the harmonic exercise I've given in the handout. You probably can't see it up there on the screen, but I've given it to you in the handout. And this is just one way of doing it. These were har um, harmonic exercises that I did when I was a student with Charlie Knight. Charlie was really brilliant uh, in terms of the way he taught uh, oral cavity shaping and just the pedagogy of the planet in general. Uh, but he never wrote anything down. Whenever we had a handout, if Charlie was going to give us a handout, he would sit down in the lesson and write it out. He would take like 12 minutes and he would sit down and write it off, write it off, and sort of wait while he wrote it out. So what I've done, part of what I've done for my students is write down a lot of these ideas. Um, and this is uh, this is one of them. So I'll have them do these kinds of exercises. So we'll start at the top of the page. This first exercise, uh, and the same holds true for all of these, we finger the open notes, but we make the clarinet play the black in notes without using the register key. Once again, we're not gonna depend on the register key. Some of my students, uh, occasionally, if they're really struggling with, with uh, grunting or squeaking, I'll take the register key off during the lesson and put on a piece of scotch tape. And make, okay, now play your piece without the register key. Do it all with your air and with your armature and your, and your voice. And it's a struggle, but they can really do it. And then towards the end of the lesson, I'll put the register key back on and, and it's like a miraculous transformation. It works really well. We depend so much on crummy register keys and they'll, they let us down every, every time. So this is the first test. I'm gonna finger the notes along the bottom, but using my bottom lip and changing the shape of the oral cavity, I'm gonna make the clarinet play third partial. And then I just come down the scale. Seems relatively easy, but for a lot of students that are very, very difficult, especially the last few notes. For many students, it takes them a year or more to get to the point where they can do that. You have to be very open, you have to really support the air, and you have to have a high middle of your tone. But it's a really great test because the air support and the embouchure and the voice that you need to use to play that last note is the air support and the embouchure and the voice that you need to play most of the clarinet. And I love exercises like this, exercises that show the student from the inside out what it's supposed to feel like. I think they're really worth their weight in gold. So 
I can send a student away with this exercise, and if they do it, and if they pay attention, it can be very, very powerful. You can really learn a lot. I think we as teachers, you know, I can draw pictures of the tongue and the roof of the mouth of what it's supposed to look like, and I can describe it, but until they feel it themselves, it's a, it's a little bit meaningless, right? It's like little children. You have a little toddler in the kitchen, uh, and he wants to be near the stove, and you say, no, you, know, you can't be near the stove, the stove is hot. But when you're chewed, you don't really know what is hot, what is hot means. Not until he puts his hand on the stove and burns himself. Ah, that's what hot means. It, I think it's the same thing with these kind of exercises. I can describe it, but once the students feel it themselves from the inside out, then it becomes really profound and it really sticks. So this voicing. exercise is kind of a test. And then the second one, we walk back and forth now between first and third partial. We'll add our articulation. They don't need to be fast because these are not exercises about speed. They're more about getting that a clear, clean, pingy, focused kind of uh, attack. Uh, and this, once again, this may remind you a little bit of our brass lip slurs. There's a lot of similarity. That's on purpose. And you make your way down. Um, the left hand notes are relatively easy. The more you get into the right hand notes, the, the more time it takes. It's not that they're more difficult. They're not more difficult. It's just the student has to find the placement uh, for them. And once you find it, it's relatively easy to reproduce. And then going on, the third exercise, now we fold in fifth part. On the clarinet, we use first, first, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh, and sometimes thirteenth. But that's most of the clarinet. So if we can learn first, third, fifth, seventh for our younger students, that'll get you through most of the repertoire. Uh, a lot of the repertoire. Ninth and eleventh, uh, maybe in Copeland, Copeland Piccaro, I think we have some of the higher ones. Um, the first, third, fifth, and seventh should get most of the students through most of what they need to play. So there's partial. And I don't know if you can see, but I'm going down with my jaw slightly on the reed. I'm not pressing in. I'm just very lightly, like much like the guitar player, lightly pressing his finger on the string. I'm doing very much the same thing here with my bottom leg. I don't know if you can see it. And once a student feels that, it becomes very, it's very obvious. And it's very clear, and it feels good. It feels really nice and it's very gratifying because you're not fighting for time. You're going with the physics of the instrument, uh, and then if you can do that, it, it'll do whatever you want it to do. Right. So they're fun, they're fun to do. You don't you wouldn't do the whole page. You would give the student maybe one one or two lines for several weeks or a month until they felt good about it. And then continuing down the page, number four, number five, or maybe just more rapid versions. There's less repetition. So the rules, if you look on the harmonic exercise sheet, the things that I wrote on the bottom, those basic principles I think are important to keep in mind for these exercises and just for playing the clarinet in general. You finger the open notes, but make the clarinet play the filled in note. Use your oral cavity shape. It's not about extra pressure. One of the things I like about doing these exercises is that there's really no way to do them wrong. If a student tries to muscle it out, 
right? Say on a brass instrument, you kind of muscle out a high note. You're not supposed to, but you could. Here, it totally doesn't work. The, the, the clarinet just stops. It's like trying to walk a cat. <laughs> you have to go the way it wants to go. If you don't go the way it wants to go, you can't, you can't really force it. So it really discourages any kind of vibrant, which is also a really, a really great thing. So it's oral cavity shape, and it's rolling the, the jaw up and down the reed. Uh, and you may say, where? You, you do it by feel. And I find young students, once you start them down this road, they can kind of figure it out themselves. Um, Back of the tongue is relaxed, the middle is high, the tip is low. Um, the left bottom jaw gently roll up and down, sorry I misspelled gently, uh, on the reed to find the appropriate note of vibration, the reed to partial. Do all the exercises with good air support and a clear teeth. Uh, and then we want to listen for that characteristic clarinet ping. Now this is, a, this is an excerpt from a book by a man named Paul Drushel, the fingering, uh, fingering chart that he wrote a book called uh, uh, the Altissimo Register, a partial approach. And he, he doesn't mean an incomplete approach. He means he's, he's looking at the Altissimo Register in terms of what partial those notes are derived from. It's a really great book published by Chalumeau Publications. You can still find it. And what it is, is this is all of the notes on the clarinet. There are probably some extreme high Altissimo notes that he's left out, but for the most part, this is major through even the most crazy 21st century repertoire. And you can use you could use something like this as a template to make your own kind of exercises. So for instance, if I started on the first line E and went left and tried to play all of those notes. So thumb and first finger E, maybe I can just get three harmonics out. But on the low E, I could get five or, or, or six out. Um, and you can use this as a template depending on what your students need. They're playing some piece that has, say, a lot of fifth and seventh partials. You could have them work on fifth and seventh partial using this as a, a template to kind of create your own exercise. Now, I'd like to just take a moment to talk about, if I can, Great. Um, to talk about air, when we're doing these kinds of exercises, either amateur or tummy exercises, sometimes we forget about the air. So uh, when I'm working with this kind of stuff on students, I always make sure to take a moment to just remember, to remind them about the fact that you can have the most beautiful amateur in the world and the most beautiful tongue position, but if there's no air behind it, uh, it's all for naught. So when, when I'm doing this kind of practice, I try to talk to them a little bit about the air. So uh, one of the ways I do that is through long tongue exercises. We all have different kinds of long tongues that we do. Uh, and I'll have my students do uh, uh, what I always tell them is they, they should feel like they're inhaling basketball. So you inhale a basketball and you exhale a thread. Uh, there's a great exercise that we can all do that I call the finger breath, where you take your hand and you put it up in front of your mouth. Maybe some of you have done this before. So you make kind of an O shape with your lips. You can go ahead and try this if you'd like. Hand in front of the mouth and then inhale. Ooh, listen to that sound, yeah. What you're hearing literally is the wind whipping past your fingers. And you can count a lot as a teacher just by the quality of the sound. So first of all, if there's no sound, if there's no sound, the students aren't inhaling quickly enough. If the sound is high pitched, it usually indicates some kind of tension in the throat. So what we're looking for is a low pitch sound. Right? And it's easy, it's fun, and it works incredibly well. I didn't say anything about the diaphragm, I didn't say anything about the intercostal muscles, and all of a sudden the students are breathing really well. So finger breaths. So when we do our long tones, we want to begin with the finger breath. That's the inhale, the basketball part. And then when we exhale, the tongue needs to go up to the roof of the mouth so that we're blowing through an E. Inhale a basketball, exhale a thread. 
So you can try with me. Sounds like a rain stick. Rain stick. So we get a nice, quick, relaxed, low, cold inhale, and then a, and a long, focused, fast exhale. This is what we need to play the clarinet. And part of the reason for that is uh, what some people uh, sometimes call this uh, Venturi principle. Venturi was a physicist. Uh, I guess uh, he worked with Leonardo da Vinci, and he uh, figured out uh, the true effect. He figured out that a fluid moving through a smaller aperture has a much greater speed than a fluid moving through a larger aperture, given the same amount of pressure behind it. Okay? So if we blow through an E, if we make a small aperture between the tongue and the roof of the mouth, we get much faster air than if we have a very open oral cavity. The open oral cavity is good on some instruments. Maybe some instruments you actually want to have that open oral cavity. But on the clarinet, it's a disaster, right? So some students, they're, probably, they're, they're good at inhaling a basketball, but then they exhale a basketball. And the air just goes, goes away. So if you picture, imagine I had two tanks of fluid filled with exactly the same amount of fluid, exactly the same dimensions. And one had a small spigot 